Great. Uh, so hello, everyone, and welcome to the Houston 2020 Visions lecture series. Uh, tonight, we are focused on rethinking hubs. And um, I'm excited to welcome everyone. And if you can see my background, that is from earlier today, where we hosted Mayor Turner at our brand new architecture center, Houston downtown. Um, and we walked through together to see the new exhibit that is on display. Um, if you've, you've made it to our presentation tonight, you may be aware that it is on our website, um, available for viewing at houston2020visions.org. And um, so we encourage you to go visit that and soon it will be um, available for visiting in person through appointments um, with limited capacity people. Um, so on to the show tonight, I'm excited to introduce Ilya Azarov, um, a celebrated architect um, focused on disaster mitigation, resiliency planning, strategies, and design. He has been become a dear friend over the years and has been um, extremely supportive of our efforts to um, create a more toward a more resilient future for Houston and our region. And we are so thankful for his participation, lending his expertise and advice um, to our community over the years. Um, and uh, he specifically related to this, uh, he has participated as a juror on the Houston 2020 Visions exhibit and it really helped craft um, the exhibit that you see. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ilya. Thank you very much, Catherine. And it's so uh, great to be here tonight. It's such a pleasure. If you hear some background uh, noises uh, emanating from behind me, I'm, I'm uh, in a field office, but um, I did want to say I'm really thankful for being here. And I wanted to thank uh, AI Houston, as well as the city of Houston for including me in all of these wonderful uh, uh, efforts that have been going forward. And um, so we're at this moment of a rise to resilience. And I think many in Houston and those listening in have experienced this wherever that tipping point was. Uh, whether it was, uh, you know, Hurricane Maria for Puerto Rico or Katrina for New Orleans or, or Hurricane Sandy for New York City, uh, New Jersey. Uh, you know, Harvey was the tipping point for Houston. And maybe you call it a wake up call, whatever you, you, you think about, we understood very clearly and succinctly that you can't go back to the way it was. There is no possibility that what we were doing before can continue into the future. And so what I was grateful for is to be included in this process and to bring some of my ideas and expertise and learn from many of you who are perhaps on this call who participated in the Visions 2020. And some of those things we're gonna just briefly talk about uh, this evening. So first and foremost, um, a couple of things about resilience hubs. It's, it's not often that we come to a place that we recognize historically something new in architecture. Now there have been forms of hubs in the past. In fact, um, when we think about hubs, you know, they're buildings that operate before, during and after a disaster. They are ready or they're steady state assets that we often rely upon for local emergency management or, or and city officials or communities. And the creation of resilience hub networks has been identified as an essential component um, all across the world uh, for cities that, that, that need to find a better way forward. Um, and one of the clusters that emerged from, from this incredible effort for Visions 2020 was this hub typology. And there were several submissions that began to look at hubs. So um, I'm gonna leave that for our, our jurors to discuss some of these, these elements. But um, the piece that I wanna to, want to mention here at the onset is what was new in this process was that the new hub typology that everyone is seeking and working on, it conceptualized sort of an innovative construct that not only protects communities before, during, and after disaster, not just sheltering people, but it also regenerates the city, its environment, its economies, and rediscovers what is called a uniqueness of place. So I'm, I'm hoping to hear a little bit about that tonight. But let me tell you about the jury, jury process. So um, when 
when we all flew into Houston to, to talk about and take a look at all of the amazing entries that were there, this was not a competition. This was something about an evaluation of the ideas that were out there to seek out clusters, synergies, and common threads that really brought innovation forward, new ideas. Because remember what I said, you, after a tipping point, you can't go back to the way it was. You've gone over that apex and everyone realizes what's next for us is how we define our future. And so this is a, a moment for communities, government, the design industry to all come together and say, the new way forward needs to be found. And in the pool of, of submissions, we did find various clusters and synergies and common threads. Um, in effect, once we found those clusters as jurors, those robust discussions really then examined um, are we creating a vision of the future or are we really looking at something that is more immediate? So that brought us to this idea of what a time scale is. Are we looking at immediate needs versus long-term synergies? And that also was something we discussed in Band-Aids. Are we looking for something that is an immediate need that is just going to stop the bleeding as, as part of what has to happen after a disaster? Or are we trying to think beyond of transformation into the future? So these are the, the conversations we had. But the other element that came up quite strongly in these, uh, in these submissions were this idea of culture of place. So I said uniqueness of place. That was something about geography, um, what it means to be from various parts of Houston, uh, the ecosystems, the geographies of people who live there, the socioeconomic circumstances. But then this culture of place drills deeper down into the historic elements and asking the question, who is the community that is being served here? And how can that community elevate into the future to become self-reliant as well as, um, as quite, uh, quite resilient on their own? And those were some of the elements that came through the jury process. I won't belabor that, but I have to tell you, the people that were involved from the city, from the design industry, and from all around uh, the the, uh, the U.S. that came together for this, uh, were were uh, quite impressed and uh, quite dedicated to making Houston a resilient, incredible place in the future. So, um, before I turn it over to my colleagues to give you this incredible background, and I'm sorry for my background, all of the the noise that you might be hearing, is that. Um, uh, I would like to uh, again thank um, AI Houston for this opportunity, the city of Houston uh, and the Stantec team who I've um, uh, had, had the good opportunity to work with. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn this over to my colleagues. Um, Laura Schacklaben uh, will be speaking first. She's a senior principal with Stantec and she'll be presenting the LilyPad network. And she'll be followed by Shannon Bugs who's the director of the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities at the city of Houston. And with that, thank you very much. And thank you for being here this evening to really look at this new typology and new ways of, of becoming whole again. All right, well, thank you very much, Ilya. Um, it's such um, a pleasure to be able to be here tonight as well to um, get to present the LilyPad network um, to you guys. This is um, a labor of love of a lot of people. Um, I myself am an architect by trade focused on education design, but I have colleagues um, who are urban planners, uh, housing architects, landscape architects, water engineers, um, and what's so exciting about Houston 2020 Visions um, as a program is that it was really seeking out holistic solutions. Um, and so that's what our team strove to do. And of course, um, we engage um, many, many more people outside of our organization um, you know, to, to try to come up with the most holistic um, response and vision of our future that we could. The LilyPad network itself it's really a concept um, that capitalizes on existing community assets. It, it recognizes the fact that um, 
when we're dealing with resilience, there are a lot of needs and limited uh, dollars sometimes to handle those needs. And so it's finding a way to capitalize and build up what we already have. Um, and so sometimes that can be, when we're talking facilities, it can be schools, community centers, faith centers, and, and really rethinking them as safe havens or hubs, um, or as this concept envisions them, them as lily pads. And what's really important is that they're tethered both to their local communities, but also tethered to each other to imagine this much larger network um, that can respond more actively um, to threats and stresses. Next slide. So many of us know all too well and remember Hurricane Harvey. And of course that um, was a major catalyst for the conversation in general. Um, and, and we remember all the devastation around us and we remember the numbers, the $125 billion in damages. Um, and, and that's important, you know, we, we need to classify, we need to understand that damage. Um, and so a lot of times it's that dollar value of, of damages that we, we turn to and it helps us understand how large the impact was. Go to the next slide. But what we need to remember is that it, at its core, resilience is about people um, and, and that many of us have our own stories about Hurricane Harvey. You know, I myself, this is a picture of my two kids um, in a raft that our neighbor blew up so that we could float them across the street and try to make it uh, a somewhat entertaining experience and, and not all traumatic. Um, but as you, as you talk to people, you realize that that's, that's what we all remember, that it's the human response to these things that's important and that we need to address that. Next slide. And so at its core, you know, we have to recognize that social equity and community contribute to resilience. And that's what we were trying um, as we thought about resilience hubs and the Lilypad network. We wanted to keep that at its core, understanding um, that we're bolstering the community itself in order to help them bound forward in the future. Next slide. And so when we start um, the lily pad process or the analysis, the first thing we do is we look at the threats and stresses that we face. Um, you know, of course, Harvey makes us all think about flooding, but the intent is that it's gonna react to any threats and stresses that a community might face. So mobility is something to think about. Um, poverty is something to think about. You know, we talk a lot about living, um, you know, dealing with flooding, but we also have to realize that drought is a real possibility. And so, um, you know, we can't just look at our threats and stresses of today. Those are going to change over time. And so we need to be able to step outside of, of where we are today and imagine what we might face in the future as well. Next slide. And again, at its core, it's about people. And what we know is that strong, culturally diverse communities where people know and respect each other, they fare better when, they're, when they face distress um, or disaster. And so the social aspects of resilience are just as important as that physical response. And that's something we wanted to keep at the core um, of this, uh, of this uh, concept. Next slide. And we also need to remember, because we're talking about people, we have to remember that it's about relationships. Um, those that fare better are those that are, have a network and relationships and not um, independence. Next slide. And so as we started to um, unpack these threats, we wanted to look at it at each scale. We wanted to look at it through the lens of human needs. What are the things that we need? If we take flooding as an example threat, what are the things that we need at the individual scale? You know, there, we need access to information and data. We need preparedness education as individuals because we may not always have other people there to help us um, in an emergency, depending on the size. Um, and then you have things like uh, shelter and social connections. And, the, and so we start to assess those human needs at each scale. We look at the neighborhood scale. We look at the community scale. And then ultimately we look at the city scale and beyond. Next slide. And then we also need to realize that, you know, while we can talk about Houston as a whole, we know that there's distinct challenges in our communities 
in and around Houston and they have unique challenges. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that if we look at one neighborhood and we start to break down the data um, and some of the statistics of that neighborhood, you start to see that they may have very different challenges from another neighborhood. One neighborhood um, may deal with a lot of flooding, um, may have a lot of mobility issues. If we go to the next slide, um, in another neighborhood, they have a different set of challenges. And so the interventions in those neighborhoods need to be very different and they need to be prioritized based on the needs of those, um, those communities. Next slide. And so when we, when we talked about the network, we wanted to, it's both a structure and an approach. Um, and so when you're looking at the approach, it's about first and foremost, um, engaging with the communities, engaging both with the local communities and larger stakeholder groups to really understand the specific needs um, and educate on what, what is out there, what grants, what funds are available. Um, it's about identifying the shocks and stresses, of course, um, prioritizing those things um, and, and realizing what are the, the critical things that we need to address first. Um, evaluate, of course, then you go into the planning phase, finalize what your plan is, and then always, you know, after implementation, coming back and rechecking it. And this is something that is, um, that is ongoing. You know, I think one, something that we know about resilience is it's not something that you do and check the box and say you're done because we know um, that it's not static, it's, it's ever evolving. And then we kind of, you know, we took the lily pad concept um, and really kind of to understand it, we kind of broke it down to a structure. And so if, you know, on the surface of a lily pad as a, a plant, what you see are these individual lily pads. And on the surface, it looks like they're all very independent. But what the strength of a lily pad is that it's actually this network below the surface that is holding it all together um, and making it thrive. And so if we think about it in terms of the resilient facilities, the hub scale, um, you know, each of those lily pads may be those hubs. And then you may have the model facility that helps with um, to develop other facilities and inspire other facilities. And then, of course, there's all the support for those hubs, the connections to each other, um, connections to the private sector, um, connections to government, nonprofit organizations, all those things that have to work together uh, to sustain that network. Next slide. And so when we talk about solutions, we also talk about solutions at, at each scale, just like we talked about the human needs at each scale. And so the, some of the things that we imagined were at the individual scale, it's about uh, connection and connectivity and education. So there might be a lily pad app that, that gives someone immediate access to their neighbors to their local representatives. And when I say local representatives, I mean the people that are gonna help them that they can get in touch with in, in the event that they need help. Um, at the neighborhood scale, it may be these, we envision what we call the lily pad fleet, which is an aqueous uh, vehicle fleet that on sunny days is out in the community educating people on how to be prepared on, you know, for disaster on their own, um, but on, those days where disaster strikes, they may be the vehicles that are actually going out and bringing people to safety. At the community scale, it might be the, the physical building, the hub itself, um, which in some communities would be the renovation um, or retrofit of an existing facility to make it more ready and more prepared. Um, but there, we, we may find through the analysis that there's communities that don't have any of assets that could serve in that capacity. And so in those, it's important to make an intervention to make sure that they have uh, that type of facility. And then of course, the city scale is really where we imagine um, that these things start to be connected and that there's this infinitely scalable um, solution. Next slide. And so, you know, there's a lot of discussion um, about resilience hubs. And I think what, what this, um, idea and concept was really trying to drive home is that um, that we keep the communities and the individuals and the human needs at the center of all the conversations and that we realize 
um, that the hub itself helps the community, but creating a network beyond that and connections beyond that is going to make each of those hubs um, more resilient as well. And so um, if we create this infinitely scalable network, then it can ebb and flow um, and react more quickly to anything that comes our way. And that's it, I'll pass it on. Good evening. Uh, I am, as uh, earlier said, Shannon Buggs, uh, the director of the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities. And on behalf of Mayor Turner, uh, I do want to say thank you to AIA Houston Chapter and at-large council member David Robinson for including the Complete Communities Initiative in this important panel discussion about community scale resilience and its ability to improve the quality of life of Houstonians. Hi, council member. It's good to see you. Um, Complete Communities is an equity initiative that moves Houston forward on expanding opportunity and rectifying injustices. And one reason we're doing this work is because every neighborhood in Houston should have an identity and a voice in its development. So we built an inclusive and responsive community planning process to elevate the voices of residents who have been ignored for too long. Every inequity that Houston needs to address exists in the complete communities. And for Houston to remain a city where people can start with nothing and make their way to a different place economically and socially, and actually if you'll go back to that last slide, um, Mayor Turner grew up in a complete communities, um, Acres Home. He continues to live in that com complete communities. And he talks about his journey from being the son of a maid who worked at the Rice Hotel in downtown Houston to being the mayor of the city of Houston and working in City Hall in downtown Houston. And it's that trajectory of economic mobility that we are trying to protect and move forward and keep as a part of Houston's culture. And for that to happen, we can't have neighborhoods that have pockets of economic distress and disinvestment. And we can't assume that the market will take care of everything. People in the com complete communities are just like all of us on tonight's panel discussion and in the audience. They wanna live near good schools, safe and fun parks, and businesses that cater to their needs and wants. Next slide, please. So what are the complete communities? Um, this map shows you where uh, all of them are uh, here in the city of Houston. And they are um, the first uh, five were designated in 2017 and the next five were in 2019. And one in six Houstonians live in the complete communities and it represents 10% of the city's land uh, are within the boundaries of the complete communities neighborhoods. These 10 neighborhoods represent the diversity of our city, with 25% of Houston's Black population, 19% of our Hispanic neighbors, and 19% of our Asian residents living in complete communities. My sound is a little fuzzy. Thank you. Um, and although only 4% of white Houstonians live in complete communities, the total number of that portion of our population is just higher than the total number of black residents in complete communities. And the Latinx community is the highest in total numbers with over 1 million complete communities residents. Next slide. Complete Communities is an equity initiative that addresses the economic disinvestment, health disparities, educational underachievement, environmental discrimination, and other social injustices <clears throat> that too many Houstonians, I'm sorry, that too many Houston communities have had to reckon with for decades. <clears throat> This slide shows the um, uh, life expectancies differences between the acres, the Cashmere Gardens neighborhood and one that is less than 10 miles away, the Washington Avenue Memorial Park area. You can see that people in Cashmere Gardens are expected to live 20 years less than the people living in 
the um, Memorial Park, Washington Avenue area. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Earlier, the initiative was launched in 2017 and started with five pilot neighborhoods, Acres Home, Golden, Near Northside, Second Ward, and Third Ward. City Council adopted those action plans for the complete communities in August of 2018. Also in 2018, the Houston Endowment awarded the City of Houston a grant to facilitate the creation of the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities and the Greater Houston Community Foundation in collaboration with the city launched the Complete Communities Improvement Fund to receive charitable donations. In 2019, I was hired as the inaugural director of the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities and Mayor Turner announced the second phase of the initiative with the addition of five more neighborhoods, Ailey Westwood, Fort Bend Houston, Cashmere Gardens, Magnolia Park, Manchester, and Sunnyside. Complete Communities is a collaborative effort involving residents, community stakeholders, and all City of Houston departments and divisions, the city leadership from the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities, the Planning and Development Department, and the Department of Neighborhoods. If you, next slide, please. Sustainable neighborhoods are built on a foundation of functioning community assets or building blocks. But we also know, as Ilya said earlier in his um, discussion about the hubs, that the foundation for a resilient future starts with hubs. Complete Communities through its hub anchor partner projects is focused on ensuring the 10 neighborhoods have foundational assets for their residents and business owners to succeed. We know that not every community is at the same place, so the initiative works closely with community stakeholders to increase impact and eliminate development redundancies. The hubs in the complete communities go, quote, beyond the traditional role of simply sheltering people and distributing relief materials, as Ilya wrote. A signature capital project in every complete community will serve as a catalyst for other developments that improve the built environment and quality of life in the neighborhoods. We also need, as we are developing the initiative, a replicable and consistent project framework to plan and develop complete communities hub corridor anchor projects as the initiative continues to scale its impact and capabilities. Next slide. <clears throat> Neighborhood parks is one of our areas of equity that we address through complete communities. And as the COVID-19 impact uh, pandemic has renewed Houstonians appreciation for our parks and open spaces, we are all spending more time in the green spaces closest to our home. But many of us are seeing areas of need that are a result of deferred maintenance. And so for a year, the Greater Houston Partnership and the Houston Parks Board has engaged with the Houston Parks and Recreation Department and the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities in the effort to rethink how Houston city government and philanthropic communities fund neighborhood parks. This 50-50 Park Partners Program, as well as the Resilient Houston Strategy, Plan Houston, and HPARS Master Plan, are all efforts that seek to enhance the green infrastructure in the complete communities and address the overall the environmental injustices that have occurred in these neighborhoods. Next slide. We also are developing hub anchor projects. So the four signature capital projects selected um, for an engagement by um, a project management office team are the highest priorities for our residents and community stakeholders. Um, they are the Bethune Empowerment Center and Acres Home, which will be a workforce development hub with middle skills training programs and small business owner support services. The Sunnyside Energy Solar Farm is positioned to accelerate the city's energy transition efforts, employ Sunnyside residents, and provide low-cost energy to neighborhood homes. The Fort Bend Houston area of our city is a food desert far from the multitude of arts and culture venues that bolster our city's reputation as a performing and visual arts mecca. The Edison Arts Complex will transform the area with sit down restaurants and performing arts venues with rentable spaces, and it will be similar to the Match in Midtown and the Deluxe Theater in Fifth Ward. And then we're looking also at the Ailey Forcewood area. Um, some of you may be well aware of the fact that Houston is the US city with the highest rate of human trafficking and the locus of most of the human trafficking activity 
in the United States is Bissonette Street, a main commercial corridor in the Ailey Westwood complete communities. But we also as a city are a model for uh, municipal anti-human trafficking efforts. And so part of that work is to develop a social services hub that's focused on providing services and opportunities designed to curb the reach and impact of human trafficking and pushing Houston forward um, to work in economic development um, spaces to bring in social policy changes that will help to reduce trafficking in our city. So that gets to Ilya's point that it's more than just um, environmental uh, resilience, but several ways in um, social resilience. Next slide, please. In Cashmere Gardens, um, specifically, we did some resilience planning work. So the Cashmere Gardens Complete Communities Action Plan has 32 goals, 80 projects that are organized into 10 focus areas, and it also has an introductory section focused on COVID-19. The highest priority focus areas for the Cashmere Gardens um, community stakeholders are economy and jobs, flood resilience, and safety. At the request of residents in Cashmere Gardens, Houston's Chief Resilience Officer, Marissa Ajo, conducted a resilience public meeting in Cashmere Gardens that led to the community incorporating Resilient Houston Strategy 17, which is develop lily pads to serve as neighborhood resilience hubs into their action plan. And that action plan is being finalized now. Those action plans, again, were developed over the course of the year with input received in Cashmere Gardens um, and eight public in-person and virtual meetings, five surveys, and numerous neighborhood support team meetings. The neighborhood support team in Cashmere Gardens is comprised of 55 residents, business owners, civic leaders, and community stakeholders who provided guidance, conducted outreach, and helped to shape the planning process for Cashmere Gardens. And then just so that you're aware, all of the complete communities have NSTs. And in the pilot round, um, those neighborhood support teams have either retained their community engagement-based structure of being a neighborhood support team, or they've evolved into working groups to facilitate implementation of the 10 focus, group, um, focus areas for each of the plans. Next slide. So in closing, I just wanna reiterate that the Complete Communities Initiative in Houston is our best response to racial inequities, environmental injustices, economic disparities, and negative social factors. It is a collaborative approach to provide substantive transformative support and resources in communities that have been systematically under-resourced for decades. But its success depends on public-private partnerships to identify and leverage the funding to implement lily pad networks and other solutions that will uplift the quality of life of all Houstonians. All of the funding that the city is able to use in terms of discretionary funding um, from our community development block grant funding, how we um, uh, met out the capital improvement funds, we're able to leverage that public funding with the private dollars that the philanthropic community provides for different projects and programs in the complete communities. So it truly is a collaborative effort that needs everyone's support and participation. And I appreciate uh, you all giving me time to explain how we are incorporating hubs and corridors into this initiative. Well, that was amazing. Thank you both for, for incredible presentations. Um, I have a few questions for you both, uh, if, if you don't mind, um, to kick off our, our discussion. It seems that, that we have um, two extraordinary initiatives. Um, Shannon, I wanted to know, uh, maybe I missed this, how long has your initiative been running with the city of Houston? Since April of 2017. Since 2017, okay. So we're coming up on three years. I mean, so four years. About four years. So I wanted to ask you both um, about defining communities. Given that the geography of each of the communities you know, there is a, a, maybe a set geography based on street grids and whatnot, but I think both of you illustrated that a community is defined in a certain, in a different way. How do you contend with that, Shannon, first about um, the geography of the community? How do you define that to really express and answer those needs? Um, and then it's going to, I'm going to go over to you, uh, Laura, 
to talk about projecting to the future for those community needs. So go ahead, Shannon, please. So our neighborhood support teams actually helped us to define the boundaries. Uh, Houston has 88 super neighborhoods um, that were developed in the 1980s, um, but a lot of the community has um, evolved um, beyond what those original boundaries look like. So when I talked about Cashmere Gardens, the boundaries for it exceed, for our complete communities, exceeds the boundaries of the super neighborhood. So we have a portion of Fifth Ward that's in there. Um, we could have added in Trinity Houston Gardens, but there was a decision made by the residents of both Cashman Gardens and Trinity uh, Houston Gardens that they did not want to add a portion of that super neighborhood in, even though the super neighborhood president for that community attends all of the Cashmere Gardens uh, complete communities um, um, meetings because they are very clear that the gentrifying um, impacts that are happening in Fifth Ward and in Cashmere Gardens will have an impact on Trinity Houston Gardens so they are staying connected. We also expand the boundaries of Acres Home based on the reality of how people are living in that community. Sunnyside also had an expansion with a leaf. We added a portion of Westwood into it based on the overflow of um, human trafficking and its impacts in that general area and wanting to make sure that we had a cohesive uh, plan that would address this and try to contain that um, problem into the areas where it is now. We also looked at, um, you know, we added second ward as uh, in the first round and it was a natural progression to add Magnolia Park and the Manchester uh, area to that because a lot of folks when they come into second ward they don't realize they have driven into magnolia park or onto manchester they just know it all as the east end and so it gives us some consistency and be able to provide um, solutions that can impact and assist both of those all of those neighborhoods thank you um laura you know so if if the hubs that you're proposing um really address these unique uh neighborhoods or or or, or whatnot uh, can you tell me a bit how you're defining the the geography of the neighborhood and but moreover how do you constantly redefine or project to the future because you mentioned project to the future and that is really interesting to me you've got population growth shifting geographies of, of people places economies so can you muse on that for a little bit and tell us how that how the hub really can respond to those things yeah absolutely so, you know, one of the things that I think is, is interesting that we talked about um, a lot is that dis disasters and threats and stresses, they don't know the, the political boundaries or the geographical boundaries that we make, right? Um, and, and so it's about connections, it's about relationships. Um, and we've seen a lot of that through hurricanes and, and now more recently through the pandemic um, that, you know, the types of things that started happening, there were supply chain uh, challenges, right? And those that had um, connections beyond just the people sitting next to them, you know, may have fared better in those situations. Um, and so while you have to start somewhere and you have to define, you know, um, an area that you're talking to and engaging, I think it's important to always be stretching beyond whatever you know boundary that you're starting to set, you know, and and always be pushing yourself to say, do we have all the right people in this conversation? Um, in terms of the future and envisioning the future, you know, what I what I think is really interesting is obviously, you know, the the concept, um, you know, the discussion of lily pads is very much um, kind of a play on words, right? With flooding and, and that's what everybody had on their mind after Harvey um, because it, you know, they literally float above the danger. Um, but it's very important, um, you know, to realize and we've said this all along that that's not the only thing that we're gonna face. And if we're only reacting to what happened in the past then we're not gonna be prepared for what's happening in the future. We can't, always predict the future, but if we allow ourselves to step outside of the experiences that we've had in the past or in the present and really kind of um, think bigger and learn from, from others and just kind of envision, look at the trends and say, okay, what else could come our way? Um, then I think we'd be more prepared. You know, I think if you, um, if you ask Marissa Ajo about, you know, 
were you totally surprised by the pandemic, she would probably say, no, we've been, you know, we've been talking about these types of things at a global scale um, for much longer. Um, and, and so it's that type of thinking um, that she does that I think we all need to kind of, um, you know, keep checking ourselves and think of. And so one of the things that we did is, you know, after when the pandemic hit, we did kind of an internal exercise and said, well, let's run pandemic through the lily pad network concept and see what that looks like and start to look at what are those human needs at the different scales. Um, and, and we found ourselves diving deeper into the concept of mobility and the, the concept of supply chain and, um, and health services and equity um, and what people have access to. Um, and those are all things that the pandemic has kind of exposed. Um, so it, it's just, and, and to your point about looking at the future and how do you define it, I think the other, the other thing that's important is it's a process. It's an iterative process that we have to go through. Um, and so I, when a neighborhood is working through finding ways to be more resilient, it's not a conversation that happens today and everybody walks away. It's a conversation that happened, that starts today um, and you move through it and then you, you take steps, you create action plans, but there's that important step of coming back and then saying, okay, what have we done well? And let's re-envision what, what might be our challenges in the next five years, 50 years. That's great, Laura. You bring up a lot of great things. I was going to ask you about how, how COVID ch has changed your, your thinking. So I'm going to send us back over to Shannon. So Shannon, um, since we've heard from Laura about the, the sort of change in thinking or additional layers of thought process into the lily pad in its future, how has your program looked at at not just the today that we're dealing with COVID, but what does that mean when you start to look at the community base and what have those conversations looked like to increase resilience from that hub that you're talking about into the geographies that are soft geographies? Can you tell us a little about that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> in addition to leading the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities, I am one of the five leaders of the Mayor's <clears throat> Health Equity Response Initiative and Task Force, along with Marissa Ajo um, and Janice Weaver, who's our community, Director of Community Relations, Juliette Stepetch, Director of Education, Susan uh, Christian, who is <clears throat> our Director of Special Events, but she handles, handles a lot of logistics. In this work, We've been able to accelerate a lot of what is needed in the complete communities and 17 other prioritized super neighborhoods based on community response and how they have, um, <clears throat> residents have identified their concerns. Oh, sorry, I thought this was off. Um, we had a town hall, we did a survey, a citywide survey where we aggregated the responses of the complete communities residents to find out exactly how COVID-19 was impacting them. A lot of unemployment, a lot of needs for bringing more uh, workforce development training into the neighborhoods. We have a lot of transportation access problems. Food insecurity is an ongoing problem. And so part of <clears throat> our COVID-19 response has been to identify where the city can increase its, um, its own resilience and how it's going to address some of these long-term systemic problems. So um, Marissa has in fact um, identified a source of funding for us to bring some fellows in to deal with uh, food access, equity outreach, and some other um, technology access, other issues that are long-term that need to have a complete solution developed and um, started to implement. We've been able to address with the CARES funding quite a bit of those needs, but that funding is very limited and uh, has to be used by the end of this year. And so we know um, based on the pandemic, just how deep these problems go. And we are working collaboratively with the county, the state, federal government as much as possible in order to bring more solutions to these problems. That's wonderful. So. Uh if, if I can, so I want the audience to, to understand a couple of things. This is gonna go back to questions for, for both of you. So the idea of complete communities, which I, I, I think is wonderful, identifying the gaps 
and the vulnerabilities. You both, you both discussed that. To really get rid of the weakest links or strengthen those weakest links. So that brings us to, to a place where we can make the community whole or make it more resilient. However, I want to take this a little further. If we're looking at the Houston of the future, what does regeneration look like? So in your case, Shannon, you said food, the, the sort of food issues, food desert issues, the plan for growing food yourself or the, the, your front lawn to, to growing food, those types of things. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that I would like to hear from both of you, what does beyond resilience look like regeneration as a network possibility that you're both looking at? Uh, the, the diagram you showed, Laura, is that I've got these hubs and the hubs now connect together in a network. Can you tell me what regeneration looks like from the network condition? And then I wanna go back to you, Shannon, given that the geographies you're looking at, we, we know that those, those, aren't, those boundaries um, are not fixed, right? And I wanna go back to regeneration to you. So Laura, could you tell, uh, tell us a little bit about what regeneration might look like from the hub network standpoint? Sure. Um, so, you know, I think the network itself acknowledges that not every community is gonna be in the same place at the same time, right? Um, and so when portions of the network uh, are struggling or um, are, are going down, other parts of the network might step in and help um, regenerate those others. So, you know, in one, in one way that I might look at it is to say that it is the network itself that is constantly ebbing and flowing and moving resources, moving um, action plans, moving, you know, connections around where they need to go um, because, um, because it is dynamic and it's not static. I'm not sure if that answers your question. It, it does somewhat. Um, uh, let's, let's hear from Shannon. I think, uh, I think together we've got some, uh, some good, good fodder for the next question. Go ahead. When you asked about regeneration, um, it actually made me think not just about being able to grow uh, food in our own lawns. Um, and my parents both come from families that had farming backgrounds. And so they have always had a garden. And um, I don't know why, I don't know how to do all of that. <laughs> But they are determined that my own children will know. Um, and my parents live in the third ward. Um, my children's uh, other grandmother also lives in the third ward. Um, and for me, regeneration and part of Mayor Turner's main goal in the reason to have complete communities is that people who grow up in these neighborhoods who have um, community pride imprinted on them from their experiences of childhood, um, growing up in these neighbors. I grew up in a complete community, the Fort Bend Houston area. Um, he wants all of us to be able to say, yes, I want to stay in the neighborhood where I grew up. That's part of the regeneration is having these neighborhoods receive the capital infusions that they need in order to have standard quality of life that we expect all Houstonians to be able to have, because we are a city of opportunity, but also for the next generation to be able to afford to stay there um, and want to stay there, not feel like it's a sacrifice because the family is requiring me to hang on to this house, but that they genuinely see opportunity for themselves in their neighborhoods and can stay committed to those neighborhoods. And I have those conversations with my own children about wanting them to be committed to being here in Houston, keeping our best talents here. And when you lift up the entire quality of life, then you have more people willing to stay instead of exporting themselves to the coast because they think that's just gonna be a more fun and more economically viable way of life or, or more environmentally safe, right? We have a whole conversation happening now about energy transformation. That's also part of, our regeneration conversation because people, and I earlier had a coughing attack because of my allergies, right? And I thought I had turned the screen off. So I am living through <laughs> the challenges also of all of this. And several of our complete communities want air uh, quality monitoring systems put in place, right? So they can address 
the ongoing environmental concerns and make it still a healthy place for themselves and their children and their grandchildren to live. So I think there's lots of ways that we're looking at regeneration, but the most important is that these communities need to be an option for the next generation of Houstonians. So that reinvestment in human capital and these places are now destinations as you grow up in, in your thinking. I think that's, that's quite wonderful. That ties into circular economy, all of those pieces. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you both about uh, partnerships. Uh, Laura, how important is, is partnership? You alluded to it in your presentation about just, not just in the thought process, but then tell us a little about that, but then what is uh, the importance of partnership to actually realize a hub, hub network and moving forward? So partnerships, please tell me what, what your thoughts are about partnerships surrounding the hubs in the process. It's, it's absolutely um, critical. And those partnerships um, are on a personal level. They're um, at a community level. So, you know, we envision partnerships um, with, you know, public sector, private sector, nonprofits, um, you know, uh, places of faith, all those things, all the, the components that bring a community together and make a community work. Um, I think we can all acknowledge that, <clears throat> the needs are always going to outweigh the funds that there are to accomplish those needs. Um, and, you know, so there, there's, a, there's a financial piece to that, but there's also a prioritization piece to that and, um, and a buy-in. Um, and so I think when you create partnerships, um, you've got more people that are more invested in, you know, pushing those initiatives forward, whatever they are. And then having, you know, building pride in whatever those interventions are. You know, I think Shannon, when you talked about, um, you know, making communities that people want to come back to and have pride, you know, I think it's really important to, to teach um, a sense of place to our kids, right? And, and to teach them all the great things and all the challenges about where they live, because then they, as they grow up, they start to envision ways to help address those challenges. Um, and, and so, and that's yet another way that a partnership is important. You're bringing more thought process, more experiences into the conversation and that can only make it better. I agree, I agree, Laura. And um, I, I, having grown up here in Houston, right? I did go off to school to the West, East Coast and came home. But um, one of the things I, I did not recognize um, was the value of um, so much free and um, readily available culture in our city, right? That's a big part of the partnerships that you're talking about is Miller Outdoor Theater um, is an available resource that helps us to fully understand the diversity of Houston because of the super engaging programming that they have to really reflect the diversity of our city. And going away, I was in <clears throat> college with in the, East, in the Northeast with people from New York and Chicago and all these places. And of my friends who were African-American, I was the only one who had seen black operas. I had seen Tremanisha and Porgy and Bess uh, at Miller Outdoor Theater because it was available here in Houston. And those kinds of partnerships that allow um, free resources to be available to people um, to elevate their experience of living in our city is at the heart of the public-private partnerships that we need for the collaborations in the complete communities. Um, the residents have prioritized what's most important to them. And if they had all the money in the world, they would make everything in their action plans come to reality in two years and be done. We don't have that, right? And so what's been amazing about this Complete Communities Initiative and the support we're seeing from the corporate community, including the AIA, which has helped us on housing, is that we can say directly to those interested in supporting the initiative, this is what the residents want done. This is what the community stakeholders have said is most important for them to see happen in the next zero to two years, two to five years, or within five years. And that helps to focus where we put our money, <clears throat> where we put the emphasis, who steps forward to say, yes, 
I do want to partner with the city. I do want to partner with these residents. I do want to partner with these implementing partners. At the beginning of this, we've had a lot of different companies wanting to bring in national partners to um, facilitate some of the pro projects and programs. And some of that has been successful. But what really helps us is when we have companies, nonprofit organizations that want to work with those folks who have already been on the ground and help build up their capacity so that we get back to Ilya, what you're talking about is the regeneration effect, right? And making sure that we are growing a system within our city that allows us to create Houston centric um, solutions for national problems. Um, what we're dealing with here is not unfamiliar to any other major city, but how we address it will make the difference of whether or not Houston retains its leadership capacity in the world, quite honestly. And as the energy capital, it is even more important that we have these conversations about resilience and um, not just expecting Houstonians to um, always be able to get over it, but really bring that community scale resilience into play so that our individuals are not just bouncing back, but that overall neighborhoods are continuing to elevate and grow. You know, you bring up something about capacity and, and brilliant because each of your proposals, diagrams and work, they really look at the community and you know, and this is this is nothing about uh, a commentary about government. Government has a, a, a top-down facilitating role, right? Mm -hmm. If the community is a, a horizontal autonomous network, when a shock or stress hits, the community can operate absence of communication from the government. It can continue to operate. That's there's a resilience to that. So what I like about not only the diagram, the ideology, and what you're doing is you're creating capacity, the capacity to take shocks and stresses. So I'm not on the phone calling the government saying, hey, can you come and fix this? Can you come and fix this? Because capacity has been built to a, a certain degree. That also helps the community advance. And so I'm, I'm hearing really wonderful things. Have you learned from one another in terms of how you look at hubs? For example, Shannon, the way you've described hubs, really amazing. Laura, the way you're describing hubs is really amazing. You've referenced one another. How does that network work together? How have you informed one another? And, and so, you know, Shannon, when is the first lily pad going to be built in one of these neighborhoods kind of thing? You know, just got to ask. <laughs> ah, that gets back to the money question. Uh -huh. Right, right. And we really did need to invite into this conversation Chief Resilience Officer Marissa Aho, who is advocating on a daily basis to get every one of the resilience strategy right. happening here in Houston. Um, I don't know where she found the funds to get our heat mapping project done, but she did it and we are getting the results from that. So um, in coordination with her, because the Complete Communities Initiative does fall under the Resilient Houston strategy, right? We're not, none of these initiatives are operating separately. They all are built on top of each other and the Resilient Houston strategy is our overall umbrella strategy. And so as she finds funding and resources and partners Stantec being one of them, to help us move forward all of this effort. Um, she will let me know when we will get our first lily pad network uh, going. And really? we know that the Cashmere Gardens area is one of the first, but there's also been a lot of talk about Greens Point um, being another one. I, I do believe Set of Gas is another uh, area that we've been looking at. So there's lots of areas of Houston where this can be. But again, um, as Laura was saying, and also you, Ilya, the community can say, I don't need to wait on you all <laughs> to get this done. Communities right can come together and say, and in fact, with Cashmere Gardens, um, the library has been out of commission in that neighborhood since um, Harvey, but it wasn't because of the flooding from Harvey, a pipe burst in the roof of it and flooded out. And so in our plans, we were, um, adding where the lily pads could go in that neighborhood. And the community said back, do not leave our library out. Just because it's shut down right now doesn't mean that that's not where we want to go to feel safe. And they have already started building their plans for how they are going to reposition that building into the lily pad before anything else gets started because they know Excellent. that's where people go for higher ground and to feel safe. 
That's great. Uh, Laura, I've got actually a question from uh, the audience for you. Is gentrification causing a lot of problems for future generations in the neighborhoods? And how do you plan for that to make a solution set? Well, you know, and I think Shannon can probably speak more to that than I can, or uh, more intelligently about it than I can. But I, I would say that it, it, you know, there are absolutely challenges that are presented from that. And one of the things that Shannon mentioned earlier was, you know, people having, you know, growing up in a neighborhood and then having the funds and the ability to, to stay there or move back there. And when gentrification happens, that can cause challenges um, there, of course. And so, um, you know, I think it's, if we're looking at all of our communities and we're looking at equity within our communities and, and always striving to avoid a place where we, we let one community, um, you know, be disengaged and, you know, for a long period of time and others, you know, moving forward in a different direction. If we're always thinking about our neighbors and we're always working to bring us um, to the same level, that's a start. Right, and, and so Shannon, to you, gentrification. I'm, we're starting to make these great neighborhoods. You're, you're starting to, to, to really pull these to a complete community. Well, I wanna live there. And so gender, what is gentrification and how do you deal with that? So we've been uh, putting on place several different strategies um, related to this. So one is the Houston Land Bank and the uh, Houston Community Land Trust approach, where we are um, helping the land bank to acquire land in order to build affordable housing on it. And then the land trust concept is where people can sell their uh, property into the land trust so that the land is owned by the trust, but the family owns the house, the building on it, and they commit to reselling it if they choose to resell it um, at an affordable price. And so they don't have to take into account the land costs in order to have a wonderful home to raise their family in. And they have, I think, a lease for 99 years or something on it. I, I don't remember all of the details, but there are lots of approaches in trying to deal with housing on that. Um, the other part that we are trying to get done is to increase people's ability to earn money in these neighborhoods so that as the tax rates go up, because there's not a lot we can do on, um, you know, Houston is, it has a revenue cap. Um, there are all of the property tax concerns and how the um, uh, property valuations are done. That's a whole set, other set of political conversations. But in terms of helping individuals and build up their resilience to um, address the ongoing threat to their ability to afford to live in their neighborhoods, we then want to put in job training programs. We want to improve the uh, education in the schools that are in their local neighborhoods. We want um, to, in Acres Home, we uh, worked with Workforce Solutions to bring a Workforce Solutions office to that neighborhood. Um, we have been in conversations about green jobs um, and how we can uh, increase the number of those here in the city of Houston, um, jobs for the future. We are, um, in fact, the Sunnyside Solar Farm is intended to be um, a workforce development uh, initiative as well uh, as a way of taking a toxic land, former landfill and converting it into usable and good um, space for the community. So um, there are several things. We also have to address the social determinants of health, right? Um, part of the problems is that if you have very unhealthy people, they are not able to live in their homes as long as they need to for the next generation to be financially stable enough to inherit and keep the property, right? So if you look at health as a way of transferring generational wealth, we know that um, if you have family members dying in their 50s, when the next generation is just in their 20s, they're not going to be at a state where they are gonna be able to afford all of what it takes sometimes or have the interest in being able to manage a, a house. And so all of these things come into play. Um, we have through the Department of Neighborhoods um, uh, will um, a thons where we help neighbors in some of our uh, most economically distressed neighborhoods to develop a will so that they are not losing the property through um, probate court. Um, because there's one family member that's trying to ask 
wants to do one thing and another wants to do something else and it gets caught up in the taxes and all of that. There are lots of different approaches that we have to take in order to address the ongoing um, encroachment of, um, it's not, encroachment is not right the word. Is not the right word. The economic development is what these neighborhoods have wanted and needed. They got redlined yeah. by banks and insurance companies and the wealth that should have been generated in those neighborhoods bypassed them. And so it's not that we're trying to push or keep at bay economic development. We just want to do it in a way that still allows for the sustainability of the neighborhood. And so a lot of that is getting more affordable housing stock into the neighborhood, buying up land that will allow for that to happen. So um, that's the main component. And um, I did want to say that the houses that AIA Houston chapter designed for some of our complete communities, the affordable housing, um, are really tremendous, right? To get those um, smaller homes that have um, grace and style to them, that set a new aesthetic standard, that's in harmony with what's already there, is a real tribute to the work that um, architects can do to help keep that affordable housing component exciting and um, enticing for folks. Um, they don't want to feel like they have to just live in a box um, in order to be able to live in the neighborhood of their choice. Thank you, Shannon. That's amazing. We're running down on time. So uh, there is one last question in the chat, and then I'm going to have uh, Rusty come on for 30 seconds before Catherine and I sum this up. Uh, but I think you just described the regeneration I was looking for. You're taking the the uh, sort of the brownfield sites of the 20th century, turning them into the profit of the 21st century through innovation that is the underpinning of what Houston has been since it was founded. That's amazing. So the question is um, from Holly. Uh, what can we do as individuals to help create and nourish the lily pad? Anyone have an answer for that? I mean, look, you know, you guys are looking for money and donations. That's part of it. But I think some of the education, you know, and I'm not joking, you know, if there's, you know, if there's, <laughs> great. Um, Laura, what do you think? What, what could that possibly be from the yeah, think, point of individuals? Yeah, what do you think? Step one, you know, what I love about the conversation of resilience is that the more people you bring into the conversation, the more that you learn, you know, and the more that we learn from each other. And so I, I think having the conversations and, and looking around and starting to see what's missing in this community, um, you know, how can we help? And really putting aside the individualistic thinking, you know, um, and starting to realize that if we if we build up our communities together, we're benefiting ourselves in that way. Um, and and so, you know, I think we talked a lot about relationships. I think what's important is that it's symbiotic relationships. You know, and that's that's where that regeneration, you know, comes in, right? Because it's it it just continues, um, and and so I think it's it's having the conversations, keeping your eyes open, and creating um, those relationships. That's wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. Thank is. you both. I, I am the. Go ahead. Go ahead, Shannon. I just uh, Laura's point about. Um, what's missing, right? That is part of why we call it the complete communities. We already know there's a lot that's amazing and wonderful in these neighborhoods. Um, but we also know that there are things that are missing and helping the residents to um, find and put those missing pieces back into their neighborhoods is so critically important. And so for the Lily Pad Network, um, individuals can help um, There's a lot of different programming that we can get uh, started. Um, and so we will build out a list to let you know what it's gonna take. Um, I don't have the answer right now for the individual approach to helping the lily pads get uh, up and running, but I do know we can work with the different organizations like the AIA, we can work with Stantec, others to figuring out how we get it launched. Um, and we will speak back with you. And I know David Robinson will make sure <laughs> <laughs> There he is. Hey, David. Our responsive. <laughs> <laughs> and brilliant. get this move forward. He and Marissa talk often. Um, and I, I would have unmuted her because she may have an idea right now about the individuals, but I know that there are some collective things that we can be doing. Well, um, Marissa, if I may jump in. Marissa, Marissa wrote in. Yeah, let me ahead. just say before you, Catherine, that Marissa wrote in the chat space, I look forward to working with y'all. So 
we have plenty of work to do. Thank all the panelists and Catherine, take it away. Sure, yeah, I was just going to give a shout out for our upcoming program uh, early next year that we're working together with um, Director Bugs and, and others at the city to have a charrette that will focus on some of these com complete communities um, to carry these thoughts forward um, and, and start to um, come up with some real solutions that can be eventually implemented um, and help the neighborhood, help the residents get their ideas out um, and on, on paper in ways that we can communicate to others what, what is possible. So I encourage everyone to, to look for that coming up early next year. Yes, that's a preview of all the great things that are coming. So thank you, Catherine. Director, let's work on that list together too. I, I really want to take that last question seriously. If individuals or architects within our chapter want to help, there are ways tangibly. And it's really part of the purpose of the whole program has been to try to think as practitioners, professionals, what can we do to help the city make ourselves stronger, more resilient, and um, work as the mayor has said, it's not enough. And we were discussing it this morning in the architect <laughs> center. Not enough for us to build back. We must build forward. This is true. David, that's really great. And so one thing I'm gonna, I, Rusty asked for 30 seconds, but one thing that um, I've found over the years, resilience is an action. It is not an object. So you just asked how I can help, brilliant. So Holly, thanks for asking that. You've, you've, you've really sort of embodied. Resilience is an action. The act of doing, the act of being a neighbor, the act of everything you've heard today is about resilience. And so I think that's, that's really brilliant. And Rusty, let me also say to the director, before we get from Rusty, that complete communities, remember that complete is an adjective and it is a verb. And that's, you know, we must complete. I love it. <laughs> Rusty, you're muted. I know you think I have that figured out by now. Um, <laughs> thank you all for a great program and Director Bugs, we do stand ready to help at AIA Houston. Um, our, our members are ready to help complete communities and, and uh, this was a terrific program, by the way. Um, the reason I asked for 30 seconds, I wanna tell you just a little story. Um, today has been, um, sort of a day of, of reflection and remembrance. You know, the mayor came to the architecture center. He was, he was guest number one. Uh, we haven't even really moved in yet. Uh, David, uh, Councilman Robinson brought him to the architecture center and it was terrific to have him there. Um, so it's been a little bit of an emotional day for me uh, in remembering Hurricane Harvey. That's what you see on the floor behind Catherine um, is Hurricane Harvey. And then there's a track of all the other hurricanes that have hit uh, Texas in history. Um, when Hurricane Harvey hit, uh, the, the second day of it, that day that the, the storm parked over us and was the rain was flowing down, um, the architecture center was under four feet of water. Uh, we didn't, you know, I, I was, I didn't know that by the time, by that time. What I did know is that my phone number had been published as the phone number for the fire chief. So I was getting calls at least, uh, I think we were one digit apart. So I was getting calls at least uh, every six minutes or so on how um, people offering help along the Gulf Coast. Um, I was also getting calls from uh, uh, executive directors of AI chapters from across the country on how they could help. But the one I remember the most is Ilya Azarov called me and said, we have been through this before. We can get through this. Tell me how I can help you. Um, at AIA, we, we talk a lot about uh, Black Cape architects, you know, that, and, and that is a, a phenomenon that needs to go away. Those famous architects that, that parachute into your city and they do museums and then they go away. Um, if you want to talk about a real architecture superhero, that's it right there, Ilya Azarov. And so thank you, my friend, for being here. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Catherine, did you, did you wanna um, close us out with any, any final thoughts? Yeah, um, and I just wanna echo everyone's thanks for you guys uh, putting on this panel. It was a really helpful discussion um, and getting a lot of the ideas out there and hearing a lot about the concrete solutions that are in progress and, and that we can all be part of. 
So I, I really appreciate that. Um, I uh, was struck by, you know, what you said er early on, Elia, about how, you know, we have these tipping points uh, like Harvey. And once that happens, you, you can't go back to the way it was. And, and with COVID and everything happening this year, everyone, you know, you hear sometimes we got to get back to normal. We can't get back to whatever we were before. So um, following Mayor Turner's advice of you must, you can't, you can't build back. If you build back, you're building to fail. You must build forward and build better. And so what I'm inspired by this conversation um, is that we have such strength in our community in order to keep us going in a forward uh, positive direction. Um, so thank you all. Um, and I just, uh, that's, that's all we've got today. So I encourage everyone to check out the website at Houston2020visions.org. Um, check out the exhibit and um, find out ways to, to get plugged in and get engaged and, and help us all move forward. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, AI Houston, and, and thanks for all of your friendship over the years. And I'm always available to continued help anytime you need it. Thank you. And a real pleasure. Thank you. It's been very wonderful. I appreciate it. Good night.